Thank you. Thank you, Mitya, for introduction. It's a pleasure to be here in Sofia again for the third time. And uh, I hope you enjoy the talk. Double down, Sofia. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about reactive. I hope you're not bored already with all those reactive talks. But I'll try to take it from a different perspective and show you some examples. So it won't be too much talking about what reactive is and why to use it. Ben Katz really explained all the advantages of it yesterday. So it's a nice thing I can go to the, uh, the demonstration very fast. But before, just to explain, uh, in short, what, what is reactive programming? Well, what, why do we want it? So. Basically, we don't want, do we really want to have reactive programming, reactive applications? The short answer is we wouldn't care about reactive applications if they were not good applications. So in short, reactive applications are modern, good applications, the applications we expect to work with. Because nobody wants to wait for too much time until the application gives us some, some response. No one wants to see errors in applications. It's very nice if the application can recover from its own failures, provide us at least some feedback, like Netflix does it very well. If uh, uh, you can't show, or you can watch uh, your favorite movie, it at least shows you some another, another movie or something else to distract you so that you don't need to think about the, the, the unpleasant experience you had a while ago. So in short, we want pleasant experience for users. And another thing we want, one problem we have in business is to save money. That's very easy to say, but it's very hard to do. And most, there are many, many approaches where we can save money in, with applications. One of them is moving everything to cloud. Simple idea, but not always as easy as it sounds. And I'm not going to, I'm going to talk about uh, GDPR and uh, all the data or legal stuff. But even uh, migrating to cloud is not easy because applications are just not ready for it. We need to build applications that are ready for cloud, that can take advantage of the cloud, the flexibility, how we can add more resources to the applications. And uh, if the application cannot handle more resources because it's just built the way that it waits all the time for something to happen, there's no way in adding more resources onto it, no, no, no really added value in running things in cloud if they consume the same resources as they would uh, in our local infrastructure. So we want to reduce the waste the application creates or uses. Uh, and there's a lot of waste in uh, the applications as, as we were used to do, write them because most of the time we want to please the management, add the feature, make it work, but we don't think too much about how, how much resources it will consume. It's the, the other guy's job who will test the applications, do the performance testing, and comes to us and we, we don't like him because he just says we need to improve the application. It's not fun. Like we already coded all, all the functionality. That's nice. But it's hard to dig deeper and improve the applications. And what's good about reactive, uh, reactive approach and re reactive uh, uh, mo movement is that it teaches us to think about these things in advance and to teach us a habit of writing applications as a way that we can either, either fix the problems before to make the application, by making the application run efficiently or at least it, it provides us a loophole to improve our applications later. And the simplest way is to add more resources to the application, to, to scale the application easily, because uh, resources might be cheaper than the development work. So if the application is, is written in a way that it can be easily 
extend it to, to multiple nodes and uh, uh, easily to consume uh, the power of multiple CPUs, that's good. If it's not that, uh, like that, it's all at least good if it can be tweaked, uh, easy, easily refactored. So it's good that there are so, so many calls in, the, in this conference because the uh, reactive thing is, is really a, a new paradigm we need to learn and need to think about in the, in the same way as there is objective-oriented programming uh, and any other programming, uh, other technologies. It's good to know it and we can use it in any any project where we want to focus on user experience or saving money, and that's basically every project. So this is a part where we try to uh, try to handle high loads. It is not specific, or it is not common for every application. But the thing is, we never know how much load will come to our applications. Well, sometimes we know if we are just uh, writing an application for one, uh, one uh, department in our office that counts two or three people. But most of the time, let's be honest, uh, it's, uh, the applications are used by hundreds of people and in a modern world where software is everywhere uh, and applications are targeted at normal users, they target even millions of people. And you don't have to be Facebook to have that many users. Like, not everybody is Facebook or, or Netflix, <laughs> but many companies have many customers out in the world. And at that time, you want to first uh, reduce the waste on, on a single node by utilizing all, all the threads, all the CPU power you have. And when you're out of luck and you improve everything you could, you need to support scalability so that you can take more CPU power. And that, the, the convenient way to do this is via messaging. If you pass messaging, it's, it's just an extension of, of uh, a synchronous communication uh, within, within one virtual machine, uh, communication uh, that allows sending uh, or pr processing uh, information in, in different threads according to when, when the thread is available. So the, the idea is with, within one node is to release a thread as soon as possible so that it can uh, take another load that doesn't wait. And when we go outside, we already utilize all the threads. We can just send a message and somewhere else, some other threads on a d different machine will handle the load. So that's why messaging is important, and I don't know if anybody else could find a different solution to this problem. To date, I think message is the only eff efficient solution to, to scalability. And we also need to think about failures, because they happen, they happen much more often in the distributed world, uh, in distributed environment, and again, I'm thankful for reactive movement and reactive manifesto to bring this to our attention. Because very often people tend to forget about the, the bad path, they just think about the happy path. That's why we're so pissed off that when uh, a tester or people from operations come, come to us and say something went wrong. Oh, well, it didn't work on my computer, I don't, I don't care so much. It's, it's not fun to fix things. But if we write good applications, there's a high chance that the, the number of problems in production or in tests will be reduced. So it also make, can make uh, the developers more happy by focusing on the code and not on fixing the, the problems later. Uh, let's, start, let, let's continue from a different perspective. Uh, I was talking about cloud. And in cloud, uh, uh, usually want to want to uh, deploy multiple uh, services which communicate to each other, because cloud provides the flexibility of deploying many things at a time and undeploying them when you don't need them, and it will be just a waste of resources to develop uh, everything in one monolith, which can't be scaled, or if scaled, you have to scale everything at once, another waste. So microservices is a good architectural pattern 
for writing applications designed for cloud. And uh, MicroProfile is a, is a framework that I want to talk about here, but to be honest, only marginally, because it's not targeted uh, for reactive programming. It started as a framework for writing uh, microservices uh, in the e easiest way possible and with uh, proven approaches. So it uh, it's aims not to bring completely new ideas and break as soon as they, the ideas are not uh, good, but it still uh, wants to innovate by bringing good ideas together so that they together are more than, uh, than each separately. And um, al almost all the functionalities of MicroProfile are targeted for microservices. Not many of them right now are targeted for reactive programming, but there are good news coming. I'll come to that. There's already some support in, uh, in MicroProfile, uh, which comes from uh, uh, the specifications that are, are already part of Java EE. Uh, which is, and, and that's uh, asynchronous REST calls, CDI events. The new thing that was added to MicroProfile is monitoring via metrics, which is not very, very common treat of a reactive uh, framework. But if you go deeper, every reactive framework has some sort of monitoring. You need to know what's going on because that's, it's much more complex than traditional way of programming where you had one thread, you knew what's coming, and if there was an exception, you saw a stack trace, and stack trace told you almost everything what would happen before. When you have asynchronous uh, events, asynchronous processing, the, the processing jumps from one thread to another thread, or even if it stays on the same thread, it can be interleaved with other processing, so it's not always sequential. And even even more things happen when uh, the processing jumps to another node, to another service. And when you cross the border and uh, create microservices architecture, you need to monitor all the communication and uh, how, how the microservices work, if, uh, if they are in good state or bad state. And if you have proper monitoring and metrics, you can react. The word react is important. You can react to failures or anticipate that there will be some failures in the future. So it allows you to, to fix the problems before, and ideally you would automate this. And that's uh, the idea be behind metrics and microprofile. Uh, uh, it allows that every service that uh, supports microprofile exposes metrics in a standard way so that you can easily set up uh, monitoring tools to, to de detect services if they are in good shape or bad shape, if they need to be restarted, or if there is too much load, you can start more and more nodes, uh, more, more instances of, of the service. So that's where, where the monitoring fits in, in terms of reactive style or reactive uh, systems. But there are still more things to come. Very soon, in one month, uh, there will be MicroProfile 2.0 based on uh, the specifications uh, that, are, that were upgraded in Java E8. And the most notable things are reactive API for REST client and also servers and events, which are a synchronous way how to send messages to the browser but not in the only in the browser. You can also have a Java client for SSS, SSE. So it's also a way how to stream messages. Again, another improvement in, uh, in sending messages uh, to, to power the reactive paradigm. There are, there's also support for asynchronous CDI events. This is still within one, one application or one process. Uh, there are technologies that, can, that allow to, to grab CDI events and move them to another node uh, in the cluster, which again provides an, another way to send messages. You throw a, a CDI event, you basically transfer, can transfer it to another place uh, as a message and uh, pick up uh, the message and continue the, uh, the processing. 
And even though MicroProfile contains fault tolerance functionality and interceptors uh, to simplify handling failures when, remote, when calling remote services, uh, they are right at, the, at the current stage they are synchronous, so they only uh, support synchronous API, which is not very convenient for writing reactive applications. But there's a plan to, to incorporate support for asynchronous uh, interceptors and uh, reactive streams API so that uh, you can reuse the functionality also with uh, reactive programming. And in the end, uh, there's an uh, initiative about reactive streams that was started by um, another participant, very, very recent participant, MicroProfile, coming from a light band uh, uh, company which uh, creates their own uh, reactive framework. So they are very experienced in, in reactive programming and they want to bring some, uh, some knowledge to MicroProfile to standardize and to work with other people uh, to, to settle on a common uh, behavior, some common API. And when, when this is uh, integrated in MicroProfile, then at, at that time MicroProfile will become uh, really a framework for reactive programming. Right now, we have to add something, some, some missing pieces. MicroProfile is still a good platform to, to writing applications because it's well, very simple to start, simple to use, especially if you are coming from Java EE world, you know lots of the APIs and, and the new APIs are very familiar. But by adding Rx Java and React JS, we add most of the missing pieces uh, in, into MicroProfile, where Rx Java basically pr provides the reactive streams implementation and also ability to build pipelines uh, by <coughs> uh, to, to process events and uh, pass them to another processor and chain processors. Um, and React JS. Uh, is not specifically a reactive framework, but uh, it has a nice concept of updating UI upon changes. So you don't have to write a lot of logic, you just uh, uh, re-render piece, pieces of the application when, when there's an event. You can also use RxJS uh, within the JavaScript application if your JavaScript application grows. In my demo application, it was enough to just refresh the UI immediately. Uh, Rx is good for building, building pipelines, so if you need to protest, pr process the data also on the browser before you render uh, the UI, it's convenient. But if you want to only respond to, to events from the backend and re-render the UI, uh, it's not necessary. So in the, in the demo applications, there's even some more things. But uh, you can see where it fits together right now. There, there's uh, the core thing is uh, the central part, the Java backend, which uh, contains all the logic to process information to to provide uh, the browser, the web page to the browser, and it communicates with the browser page either via REST, which is typical to to get more data from backend uh, from to the browser, but it also communicates via SSE, which is essential in notifying the browser to, so that the browser will immediately respond to events coming from, from the backend. If backend knows that there is a change, it still has to, has to pass the information to the browser, and it's, uh, otherwise all the, all, all the energy and all, all the effort put into writing reactive backend is lost because on the front end, user still needs to hit F5 to, to reload the page, otherwise you will not see anything. And uh, to, to create a pipeline of, uh, of uh, data for, or data flow pipeline, we have another, uh, another service here called data producer and uh, this is to demonstrate how we can build a mess messaging pipeline across multiple services and also to build it eff uh, effectively. And that's uh, where we use Kafka with it because it's a very, very efficient uh, message broker and it work works really well in reactive uh, uh, architecture. It supports uh, back pressure and it's uh, very fast. 
in the, the, the dispatching events. This strange three, letter, three capital letters, JCA, there are, uh, I guess most of you don't know what they could even possibly stand for. They stand for uh, Java connector architecture. <laughs> I guess it doesn't say too much to, to anybody. This is the thing behind message uh, processors or, or message connectors uh, when you want to integrate uh, uh, JMS uh, brokers into an application server or basically to any, any Java application that, uh, uh, can listen, uh, that would listen to uh, events. But in, in application servers, uh, these uh, connectors or messages from these connectors are turned into messages for message-driven beings. So uh, message-driven beings can be f filled with, uh, with messages from JMS brokers, but this JSA is even more generic. It allows you to uh, define something similar to message-driven being, but with a different interface, and it can accept uh, different types of messages. So you can also build, uh, for example, a message that uh, gets notifications from Twitter every time you, you tweet and displays uh, and creates it as, as a message for a message driven being and use the, the same functionality you know with uh, EJBs and message driven beings and react to this. And to, to continue the data flow, it's, it's not on the picture, but we'll add RxJava to turn the message driven, the, the message came that came uh, from message driven being to uh, flowable to a, a data producer in reactive streams. So that can, we can build a pipeline within our application. And uh, it, it usually works like this. So when, when you want to send a message across, uh, across uh, pro multiple processes, you either have to have a reactive streams driver if you want to use reactive streams, or if you have to convert messages to a reactive stream uh, uh, data producer, so that you can then listen and observe the producer and build a pipeline. I think there is also a Kafka uh, driver, uh, which, uh, which uh, provides these reactive streams uh, API and the producer out of the box, but uh, it's, it's not part of the project, so I, I decided to use JCI, which is standard in, in Java E, and I'm demonstrated everything on uh, Pyra Micro, uh, which is both an implementation of MicroProfile and Java E, and still it's just a 60 megabyte jar file. So it's not, not a huge thing, but it's like a Swiss Army knife. You just download it and you have everything you need, except things like Rx Java, which may end up in MicroProfile or in some form or the other later. Okay, so enough talking. I talk already much more than I thought. Uh, I'll just run the application and show you the code. That's that's uh, it. Okay. Big. Okay. Uh, so th this is this is how how we can run Pyro Micro. And in general, most of the microprofile implementations, it doesn't matter uh, which, which one, most of the microprofile implementations are very small and uh, provide either running your WAR file, WAR file from command line or building one jar that contains both uh, the microprofile implementation and your application and all the dependencies. 
So with Pyre Micro, you can do both. You can uh, run the war, war file from command line. The only thing we need to uh, support Kafka is to add this RAR file, which is something like resource adapter, which it contains uh, the, the logic or the, the functionality of the connector uh, and can um, integrate into the message driven beams. So we also previously started uh, Kafka here, so it's, it's running. Oh. Uh, it's called differently. Uh, like this and I need to change the path. Okay, let's do not front and target. And Targets like this. Wait, it will show the path to the application where it showed before. Oh, what's that? Okay, not nice. Yeah, let's go to the code. As usual, the demo doesn't work. Maybe I'll fix it. <clears throat> Meanwhile, so so the code is very simple. It's it's just a few files. Uh, it's it's uh, not just self-contained application. It also connects to a bit a Bitcoin exchange to get some data to make it more interesting. So there's a connector to the exchange which uses WebSocket. It's not, uh, it's, uh, it uses uh, the exchange's SDK, so I'm not going to, uh, to detail. The important thing is that it's WebSocket, so the, the exchange can send us messages through, through WebSockets. We don't have to always check, uh, check the data. And uh, we wrap this in, in this connector. But, and this is an uh, interesting part to, to find out how this JCA functionality works. So this is uh, annot fa fairly annotation driven. Uh, you specify all the, the properties for, for connecting in uh, the connection factory definition. Uh, and uh, one important part is uh, this interface, which is uh, the part of the, of the resource adapter we had, it, we had to add to our application. This is the name of the resource adapter. Then we specify just uh, some inf information for the thread pool and some configuration for the resource adapter. So this, it's usually a good thing to give their timeout. It's, goes along uh, with uh, uh, error landing and resilience. If we don't specify timeouts, we lose control. And in reactive applications, we need to have control over what's going on so that we can re react as fast as possible. So it's, it's better to have a timeout and react, a short timeout and react, than a long timeout or no timeout at all, because then we're stuck. Then we need to inject uh, this uh, connection factory with, with the same name as we gave it to the annotation. The reason is the annotation can be anywhere. It doesn't have to be on this class. So to connect them, we need to use this JNDI. And the rest is just uh, codes, which is not exactly message-driven message, message driven being MDB, because uh, it uses Kafka connection and interfaces from, from Kafka, which are also part of the resource adapter. So the resource adapter also contains uh, the Kafka client uh, library and exposes it, uh, exposes it uh, uh, with this, but the configuration goes through the, the, the server. 
and also thread handling uh, goes through the server, which means you have uh, more control in the server to, to configure how many threads will be used for, for this particular uh, uh, adapter, and it allows to control how much data will be processed at once. So if you have many threads, you can process many data at once, but it can also slow your application down because uh, if it's uh, it, if every uh, thread will consume CPU, they will fight for the CPU. So it's good to have the control here and not rely on the just uh, general general thread uh, um, executor service or a fork join pool in, in Java because it, then you lose again the control. On the other side, there's a front-end application which uh, listens for, for these events. Uh, Kafka consumer. Again, lots of, uh, lots of uh, configuration but it means you have more control. And uh, in, in PyR, you can even uh, specify a, a reference and environment variable or system property and provide uh, the configuration from outside. You don't need to rely on the, on the statically typed uh, values. But he, here, these are low, lower level things like auto commit interval. It means that uh, how, how often the, the messages are uh, really sent to, to Kafka and how, how long it, they are kept in cache. But uh, in the end, the interface is very simple. It's, uh, an, uh, again, very similar to message driven being. It just implements a different interface provided by the resource adapter. You get consumer resources, and then this is, this is provided by Kafka. This is from our org Apache Kafka client's uh, package. So there's not, not, not much edit to, to the Kafka uh, client's code. Well, what is uh, interesting here is that we don't process uh, the message here. If we process this here, uh, we would have to think about how, how to move, move the processing to where we want, uh, want it because uh, uh, we usually want to send the result of processing somewhere else. And uh, it's a good, good pattern to decouple the technical things like uh, receiving the, uh, the message from Kafka from the logic of processing. So here what we, what we do is just uh, emit the event on, on the flowable. And this is uh, our simple wrapper around uh, the Rx Java flowable, where first we create a, a singleton flowable which is coupled with this uh, with this uh, connector, and uh, we store the emitter. Emitter is used to send data to this flowable, so it's a, it's a producer of data, and on the other side, somebody else can uh, access flowable and receive the data from the analyst, observe uh, on the data. We also uh, here specify the threads, uh, or the schedule, thread scheduler. It uh, subscribes and observes on. It's a good pattern in, uh, in uh, containers where threads uh, uh, should be managed and somehow enriched by, by the container to provide all the context needed for, uh, let's say, dependency injection, uh, so that uh, request context and all the other contexts are properly initialized, transactional context and things like that. So here what, what we do is uh, inject a scheduler which is uh, created from... Uh, uh, from an injected uh, exec executor service. So this is injected by, uh, by the server and we only convert it to scheduler, which comes from the Rx Java library. And that's it. It's just uh, our wrapper only uh, provides the emit method so that 
you can emit more data. There's nothing like uh, completion of the data because it's an infinite stream of data. We're just listening to all the events in the topic, so we don't need to finish the data. Uh, ideally, we should have uh, we should have an error emitter, but uh, we can do that uh, here with specifying timeout. That's one way how to solve. Uh, how to solve things. If we really expect that the, uh, the message that should flow at least one per minute, we can specify a timeout. And if there is uh, no message coming in one minute, then uh, uh, the flowable will emit, uh, emit an error. But if uh, it's really a generic, generic service that can receive messages at any time, we don't need to do that because we just wait there. We, we can specify the time right somewhere, somewhere else in the application where we really want to have the messages. For example, on, on the browser level, when messages don't uh, come in, in certain time, we just uh, notify the user or some, somehow change uh, the page. And... Uh, Finally, we have, uh, yeah, this is the, finally we have uh, in the service and event resource. Uh, transaction resource. So this is uh, the other side. Uh, this is the listener of the, of the events. So and up until now, we created a flowable in Rx Java, which is uh, uh, which we used to produce messages or send messages to, and this same flowable we expose from uh, uh, from uh, the singleton bean, so that any interested party can register, can listen to this, can observe the events, and what what do you do with uh, uh, when you want to observe events, you access the flowable, uh, you specify a handler on data, and you also have to uh, have to run subscribe to really uh, express the interest of re on, in receiving the data. Otherwise, you just declare what should be done, but you don't declare that you really want to get the data. So once once we do this. Uh, here, this uh, lambda is executed for every message that we receive. We, we managed to decouple the technology, the Kafka. Uh, we, we basically decoupled it twice. One is, one is uh, with the JCA connector, which is still kind of a uh, uh, dependent, dependent on Kafka because it's, uh, there's th those interfaces, but it's easy to refactor if we change the technology uh, for something else. It would just uh, change the, inter the interfaces and, uh, and refactor the message of beans, but they would still uh, the, the messages would still end up in the, in the flowable, and then the the real listener, the real logic is completely de decoupled behind the flowable. So it just reactives, uh, uh, reacts to messages for, from reactive streams APIs and sends uh, the data to interested web pages. And this is by uh, service and events. The, the web page needs to initiate the service and event connection and then uh, we can send uh, events to uh, the event sync. This is just how it looks like uh, in Jaxares. Uh, and where they edit in Java E8 uh, this capability of uh, sending SSE even sim in a simple way. It was e possible to do before, but with you, know, you had to know formats of the data sent by the, the servers and to, to be accepted by the browser. Now everything is encapsulated uh, in this API. It's available in Java E8. It will be available in MicroProfile 2.0 in a month or so. In Pyre Micro, it's already avail available with MicroProfile because there's MicroProfile and Java E8 together. 
And another thing, nice thing about MicroProfile is it manages to fit with uh, Java E. It doesn't want to, uh, it, 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 it tries to, to avoid collisions with Java E API, even though there are just a few APIs from Java E it depends on, but it, it nicely fits to the rest. And it also works like that with other uh, libraries. It tries to think, uh, explore the ecosystem and support the, the most popular libraries. Also formats, there, there's a format of uh, metrics data, which is JSON, which is a very general uh, format. But there, uh, there's also support for, for Prometheus, which is specific for Prometheus, so doesn't support other tools, but uh, since it's very popular and convenient to use, uh, it's already supported by MicroProfile. But it's not the only option. You still have the generic JSON, which you can process with any, any client. And that's, that's the idea with MicroProfile. It doesn't want to stay, uh, it not doesn't want it to stay in the way. It tries to move out of the way so that you can do anything you want, bring anything, anything to it. But if there is something very, very interesting, uh, very, very, uh, useful. We talk about it with, within the project and talk about also with the community. Uh, there, are, anybody is free to uh, join the discussion, uh, share their experiences, say even this doesn't work. Well, we should do something else. That's important to know, <laughs> as always. And and the useful stuff gets. Fast into the into the micro profile version, much more much faster than with Java E. Maybe it's a bit slower than with normal framework when just core engineers want to decide can uh, decide on what's going into. Here it's a, it's an effort of multiple parties, multiple companies, multiple experts where we discuss the best solution, but not like for ages. We just discuss well if if it goes if if, if it might be okay. If, it, if it's fine, it goes. If there are any objections, we try to improve or postpone the decision. But the idea is to innovate quickly and to also have uh, feedback fast. So, yeah. In the end, I didn't show React JS. I don't know if you're interested in lots of JavaScript code, but. Uh, React.js is very it fits very nicely because it just uh, uh, it does define the uh, the UI and you define the state and uh, when the event comes you really uh, you change the state and the UI just rebuilds you don't need to think about it and uh, that's very nice. Uh, but what what I want to show what, what is nice about MicroProfile is the the configuration API, which is one of the APIs that's been missing in, in Java, in Java E ecosystem for, for ages, there was no, no, simp, no common way. It's like with logging, you have lots of framework, and even if they edit uh, logging framework into Java, most of the people use uh, rather other libraries because they don't like it. So we hope that uh, we started uh, configuration API, which is, which is good to be used by other parties and not just uh, something like uh, Java util logging, which people don't like to use. And in fact, uh, this, there's an also, also an effort to bring this into, into Java EE to, to be a proper standard within JCP. So uh, be mainly because it, uh, that, that was good um, feedback for this. So just a short demonstration uh, how this is used. In this application, we inject uh, just a configuration property. We, uh, the, the core part of, of this, uh, or core idea of, of this configuration API is that you don't have to think about where the, where the configuration value comes from. We just declare you need some configuration, you give it a name. You can also give it the default value. It means that the configuration is not required. If, if, there, if nobody provides it, we can use this default value. If we don't provide it, 
then it has to be provided when the application starts because the CDI, the dependency injection mechanism will, will scan all the injection points and will discover that it can't fill any value here. So also, it's also good to, to find uh, what you're missing in the application before uh, it just uh, breaks uh, during runtime. But uh, the, the important part is that it's, it's very simple. So I just insert it here. Don't think about wh where it comes from. The only thing that I need to do if to, to get it to my browser is I need to somehow uh, ask for it. And either I would, ha I would open a channel like WebSocket or Service and Events and uh, modify, uh, monitor the configuration on the server side and emit events when the configuration changes. Or simpler, simpler, not that efficient solution, but much simpler is what I, I decided for because I'm lazy <laughs> and this is not a production application, is to pull for, for the configuration. Uh, so now we get to show some JavaScript code. So here we here we define a timer uh, running every second. Every second it ac accesses uh, the rest endpoint, receives the configuration, and updates the state. It means that if the configuration changes, the UI updates. If it doesn't. There's no change. And this is just to demonstrate that the idea is not the, the very the effective solution, efficient solutions. It's just so what I have right now, I can improve it with uh, service and events or uh, any, any messaging mechanism. But the idea is that even configuration can be reactive if, if you need it. Very often you don't because the configuration is just set in, in, the, in the beginning. But it's, uh, it may be very, very useful to think about everything reactive. And even configuration might <coughs> may be useful. And in this case, um, I'll try to run the application again. In this case, the configuration specifies how, how often uh, uh, the page queries some, some data from uh, the Bit uh, Bitcoin exchange. So there are two, two different uh, flows of the uh, data. One is it queries sometimes, and the other one is uh, the, there's a continuous stream of uh, information about transactions happening online that's going with uh, another channel through a WebSocket. But in both ways, uh, the idea is to, to update the user, to have control over what's going on, and to, to react to, to events from the outside services. Uh, let's see. I won't waste your time. But if you have any questions, or if you want a T-shirt, just, just uh, we can talk after the talk. But if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer now. Yep, GitHub link will, is uh, on the presentation. I'll share the, the, the presentation with you. I uh, lost, uh, where is it? Yes, here it is.
Okay, so if, if no other questions, um, thank you for attending the talk. And I'd like to invite you to follow what's going on at Eclipse Foundation, because there's lots of, lots of new stuff going on there. There's MicroProfile that's already happening, but there's also Jakarta EE, which's taking shape, and hopefully you will see some interesting information in a couple of months about new version of Java EE named Jakarta EE. And if you want to talk with me, I have some T-shirts and stickers, so just come. Come to me if you if you're interested. Thanks.